to discuss magic mushrooms and mental health, please welcome Dr. Allison Modell Robley, Director of Psychosocial Oncology at Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care, and Dr. Stephen Ross, Co-Director of the NYU Psychedelic Research Group. Here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's Olga Kazan. Thank you. Thank you. So we've talked today a lot about the effect that cancer has on the body, but actually uh, cancer patients often are in a significant amount of mental and emotional distress as well. And that's what these two speakers are here to talk to us about is possible remedies for some of that um, anxiety and depression that having such a severe diagnosis can produce. Um, so first I want to just just toss a question to, to both of you. Why does cancer sometimes cause, you know, depression and anxiety in people? I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, first of all, the word cancer still has that connotation. You know, we've heard so many years of it being the C word, the dread word. Um, and patients immediately think about it's a death sentence or I'm going to lose my hair, I'm going to lose my ability to you know, function fully, people are going to see me differently, I'm going to be damaged goods, my future's changed, you know, what's, you know, am I going to survive to see my kids get married, those kinds of things. It's devastating, and even though treatments are getting better and more targeted, there's still a sense of dread that I may not survive this, and people are going to see me differently. So distress is very real, and as much as we keep trying to change that, it's, it's a narrative that's hard to change. And, you know, we're working on it, and I know Stephen is too. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, um, of course, the, the title of the session is, is about magic mushrooms and mental health. Of course, uh, clinically, they're not called magic mushrooms. It's called psilocybin. Tell us a little bit about what psilocybin is and what it can do for all kinds of mental distress, especially the kind caused by cancer. Yeah. So psilocybin is um, it's from a natural compound. There's 180 different species of psilocybin mushrooms. They've been used by indigenous cultures for centuries. They've been used um, in medicine uh, since the 50s, but in particular in the modern era, there's been a lot of clinical work with psilocybin. The most advanced has been in patients with advanced cancer-related psychiatric and existential distress. We completed a trial at NYU. Hopkins has completed a trial in UCLA, and that included 92 participants. And single-dose psilocybin was found to produce rapid antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects that lasted several weeks to several months. It also improved existential distress domains, uh, diminished death anxiety, and improved quality of life. So you give people a single dose of psilocybin, and their sense of dread about their cancer diagnosis goes away. Is that? Rapidly. We, we found by the end of the dosing day, you could see that they were so much better. But when we looked at their measures of depression, anxiety, cancer-related hopelessness, demoralization, it really, you know, rapidly dissolved. Um, one day after getting psilocybin in our sample, 80% of the participants no longer met criteria for depression. They were in remission from it. Wow. What kinds of things would they say after, after they had taken it or after their experience? They were kind of weird and, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and interesting. I, I, one of my areas of expertise is schizophrenia, so I'm used to psychosis. And, uh, but I, I wasn't uh, prepared for what you know, would happen. Most of them had some consequential encounter with cancer. Cancer was in some form like the boogeyman um, that they, these were challenging, difficult experiences. It wasn't that they had some big euphoric experience and felt better. They really struggled and went into the thing that was like most scary to them, struggled through it and had some kind of like resolution. People had death experiences, rebirth experiences. Uh, they were transported back into earlier parts of their life. They met spirit guides and uh, had all mm -hmm. kinds of epiphanies. I remember one of the patients, um, when I wrote my story, one of the patients I talked to said she, she met like a little crab that she took to be like cancer, the crab. Yeah. And it was like very funny to her. And that was actually like an important thing to have this like moment of levity, yeah. I guess. So, yeah. Um, and what's actually going on in their brain as this is happening? What is the psilocybin actually doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know some of it and we need to learn more. All of these drugs all the psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD, they all activate a subtype of serotonin receptor, the 2A receptor, mm -hmm. and that dramatically alters your consciousness and creates these uh, mystical or spiritual type states. Um, there has been neuroimaging that's been done, and there's various groups, including 
There's a group at Imperial College led by Robin Carhart Harris. There's been another group at Switzerland, and um, they're coming up with different findings. The Carhart Harris group having to do with the default mode network is a nice story that sounds good, but it may be a bit of neuroconfabulation. <laughs> but it, you know, that story goes that the default mode network is overactive in diseases like addiction and depression, and that psychedelics appear to dismantle this network. And so that's like, oh, it's overactive, it you know, diminishes it. But their findings have changed since then. These are more neural correlates of addiction or of the, the psychedelic experience. How that works mechanistically, neurobiologically, we still don't know. Hmm. So there are other ways to treat distress other than through psilocybin. Talk to us about the BOLD uh, program and what that, what that is and how that works. Sure. So we have a form of magic in the Bronx. We're at the <laughs> Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care. It's not magic mushrooms, but it's magic connection. Um, so the, the BOLD program started about 11 years ago where we started asking patients what they want in their cancer care outside of their cancer treatments, what would help them with their quality of life and to cope. And many of them started saying, I want to you know, do some mind-body therapies. I want to take an active role in my care. I want to meet other people who've been through it. I want counseling, very few of them. Um, and just, just to give you kind of a, a little context, the Bronx is one of the poorest communities, um, not only in the Bronx, but in the United States. It's very diverse ethnically and it's you know, very underserved. So we wanted to really speak to our patients and give them things that would fit with them culturally and personally. Um, and the biggest one was to connect with somebody who's been through it from their community, not a counselor, but you know, a cancer survivor. And we have one right here, actually. <laughs> and maybe some other bold buddies in, in the audience. Um, but they have been the heartbeat of the program because they demonstrate even some of them living you know in shelters and with food insecurity that they can still be empowered despite being disempowered by society in many ways and dealing with discrimination and poverty and all of that and they're advocates for their community and that gives them a stand and i, I think of one in particular elizabeth who says she she stands by a welcome table or sits by a welcome table in the oncology clinic and she said i have a platform you know, she's west african she said i'm so happy i have so, I, I have something to say you know and many of them you know they're volunteers a lot of them are retired and it's magical what they do, it, what they do for each other. It's really magical. And, and I feel like, you know, we can't underestimate the power of connection and support. And, you know, when you think about psychedelics, how it changes the paradigm in terms of how we look at cancer, I think this can also do it. It helps change that story that I'm a victim. But sometimes I've heard patients say, cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me, hmm. which is, sounds crazy, but because they feel... I, I found my voice, I found my purpose, I'm not defined by it. And that's not the majority, but it's possible. So I think the Bold Buddies are a beautiful example of that. Um, I just noticed, so they showed a picture of a person laying uh, on, a, on a thing with like an eye mask and covered in a blanket. Can you describe a little bit, so we know what that is, what, how the psilocybin actually gets administered yeah. to yeah the patient? <laughs> well, each participant has two therapists, so it's an unusual model. Uh, they have two therapists. There's preparatory psychotherapy about six to eight hours of going before where we take a life review and contextualize the story of cancer in that. We prepare them for the session, go over the safety parameters. Then on the day of the dosing session, the room, you know, looks like a living room-like setting, much different than a, a hospital-looking mm -hmm. setting. There's a couch made into a bed. We have them um, hold hands with us and state their intention for the day. That way they're bound to us. Um, mm -hmm. And we really want them to focus on why they're there for that day. With our cancer patients, it's you know to deal with their cancer. For our alcoholic patients, they say something related to that or depression. It depends on the disease state. Um, then we give them the pill. Um, we give them some art books to take a look at. And then about a half an hour after that, the default is for them to lie on their backs. We give them eye shade so they can focus internally. We think that heightens the ability to have these mystical type experiences, we give them pre-selected music. Mm -hmm. And that's the default. And sometimes they're there for, it's a very long day, it's eight hour psychotherapy mm -hmm. session. So it's really uh, demanding. Sometimes nothing happens, it's sometimes a very dramatic things happen. They're having a really hard time. And the therapist moved in to support them, you know, hold their hand, uh, do whatever it takes to help ground them. Mm -hmm. We have medications in the room if need be, but we rarely if ever have to use those. What, what are the potential like, negative outcomes or side effects that might happen 
as a result of this? Yeah, psychedelics are not for everyone. They are what's known as psychotogenic. They can induce psychotic states. So people that have psychotic illness like schizophrenics or people with severe bipolar disorder, they can make those disorders worse. So we uh, strictly screen for anyone that has psychosis or a family history of psychosis. People that have unstable uh, mental illnesses in other ways, like let's say severe personality disorders, we screen them out as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really want um, people that also have social support structures that are stable. Mm -hmm. uh, so psychedelics very, you know, can be very harmful, especially if the wrong people take them, and especially if they take them in recreational settings. Hmm. Um, what is sort of the, the hurdle to getting psychedelics or into more, I guess, cancer treatment centers or into, into you know, more kinds of, uh, in the hands of, of more patients, yeah. Well, the main hurdle is they're illegal. They are <laughs> they're, it's a problem. Um, <laughs> they are Schedule One drugs. They were made Schedule One in 1970 by Richard Nixon in Congress, not out of scientific reasons. It was purely political. Nixon was concerned about wealthy white people who were not thinking straight, didn't want to go to war, all these hippies, so wanted to shut them up and specifically use cannabis and LSD to shut them up, and it worked really well. And, and you know, it's a big part of psychiatry, like 30 years, 40,000 participants, and that history was erased from psychiatry mm. because of this. Mm. We criminalized addiction, started locking up African Americans because of that. Um, and so in, that has been the big hurdle. But interestingly, the FDA is extremely open-minded to developing this. The NIH has been closed-minded and they have not funded psychedelic research for political reasons, but I think that's about to change with the National Cancer Institute. Can you talk about that a little bit, what you were telling me backstage about what's next for you? Yeah, so um, a large part of my funding comes through NIH, but I knew this was an area that NIH wouldn't fund, and so I took the data from our trial, Hopkins UCLA, and I wrote a grant, what's called an R01, to the National Cancer Institute, specifically to a part of NCI that deals with palliative care. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with a program officer there who really encouraged us to do it. She checked above her head and said the politics were okay for us to submit it. We teamed up with a group at um, University of Colorado, Denver, and wrote a protocol essentially to do a phase three definitive trial in 150 participants. We find out from them in two weeks if they fund it. If they oh. do, it'll be a really big historic deal that NIH is funding it, and it'll set the stage for phase three for psilocybin and advanced cancer, psychiatric and existential distress. And you're also working on alcoholism, depression, and yeah, what else, yeah. sorry. <laughs> and religious professionals is the other study that we're That's doing. That's right, okay. And which one of those is kind of furthest along? Uh, we're, we're doing a trial of using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for alcoholism. That's 80% of the way done, 80 out okay. of 100. We're gonna be done in about a year. We just started a trial of using psilocybin to treat major depression, which is one of the biggest public health problems in the world. Our current treatments aren't, don't work that well. We, are, we finished up a trial of psilocybin administration to religious professionals. We did that with Johns Hopkins. And we're also involved in a phase three trial using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for complex PTSD. Wow. Um, hmm. So those are some of the main studies we're involved with. And Allison, if some of this becomes available, you know, this or other treatments, um, talk a little bit about your community and, and the best way, um, you know, to uh, introduce new treatments into the community and sort of what, what you've heard from the folks you work with as far as um, how they like to interact with the medical system. Well, we were talking about this backstage, and I was very excited because I think what Stephen's doing is groundbreaking, obviously. And um, in my community in the Bronx, there's a lot of medical mistrust and fear that there's going to be experimentation, mm -hmm. you know, understandably because of historical abuses. Um, but there's also an importance to um, engage minority, ethnic minorities in clinical trials because otherwise we don't know the fit between the drug and the patient and we need to make sure that it works for, for all populations. Um, so I think what he's doing is fabulous because we, you know, I just, I said, you got to come and, and do a little, you know, talk to our, for our bold buddies and engage them. And there's, there's a type of research called community-based participatory research, which just means that you get the community involved in it and get them to have a say in whether this is something they would want to bring to their community mm -hmm. and how they can see it sort of unfold in their community. So they're, they're part of it. Um, and, you know, we, there's not one road you know, to Rome, we need many to help us in terms of our mental health and our well-being. And I think, this, you know, especially when a lot of our patients were, were traumatized. And mm -hmm. I would think, I don't know if PTSD is a contraindication to using this, but it would really help a lot of our patients who are stuck in that 
story of victimhood and understandably so that the cancer doesn't have to be something that victimizes them but can be a catalyst for growth and there's this whole area of post-traumatic growth yeah you know that's very important and, and so the psychedelics could be a beautiful instrument to help you know catalyze that um okay i want to do a lightning round before we head off what's the number one misunderstanding about both of your types of work well there's a couple uh, there's a new one, which is kind of an old one, where this is that this is going to cure everybody, okay. and you don't need you can just like go out and take it and you'll be cured. That is a very dangerous thing. Th this, um, I mean, in our study, it was you know there sustained remission at five years, which is a kind of cure, but we have to be skeptical about that mm -hmm. and skeptical about anyone that would claim this is going to cure anything. Hmm. Uh, in terms of the work that I do, what's the yeah? What, what do people misunderstand about it? Oh, that it's really easy to start up a peer navigation program. Anybody can do it. <laughs> 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 it takes a lot of work, a lot of resources, a lot of commitment, training, you know, coordination. Um, you know, it's it's a tremendous amount of work. Totally worth it. You know, we're, we're we're blessed to have the people that do the work that that they do for us. They volunteer their time. And let me tell you, they're all stages of disease. They're all backgrounds. Um, they're beautiful people, but it takes a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Steve and Allison, and thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>